Well, I don't know about you, but I love food. And I know that may shock you given this incredibly athletic physique that stands before you, but I don't love food for the reason that you might think. I love food because there's something about sharing a meal with other people that just leaves a lasting impact on you. You know, some of my favorite memories from college were actually when I got an apartment with Adam, one of our other pastors on staff. You guys met him just a second ago. Uh, he and I grew up in Mississippi. We went to college back in Mississippi, and we roomed together our sophomore year. And that following summer, we made the decision that we wanted to be real adults and get our own apartment and have our own independence. And so we found this apartment to rent, and we got it. And I will be completely real with you guys. It was horrible. Horrible apartment, but we paid like nothing for it. It was about $360 a month each for the rent, and it came with some great amenities. They gave us an oven, a fridge, and for free, they included cockroaches and leaking ceilings. And so we were having just a great time just enjoying this newfound freedom that we had. But one of the things that we were most excited about was learning how to cook. And I gotta be real with you, man, we ate like kings. I'm talking ramen and hamburger helper, and all the frozen chicken nuggets a 21-year-old could ever desire. But we also wanted to learn to really cook. We didn't just want to be able to put things in an oven and throw them in the microwave. And so we made a decision that every Friday we would forego our normal college food, and we would go to Kroger, and we would pick out the best ribeyes that we possibly could, and then we would learn to cook them in a cast iron skillet like the fancy restaurants. And so we did this over and over and over again, week after week, and burnt steak after burnt steak. And finally, after repeated attempts, we figured it out. We learned how to cook a mean steak. I mean, it was awesome. And what ended up happening is these Friday nights when we were learning to cook steak turned into Friday night steak dinners with our friends. And those ended up being some of my most favorite memories, just treasured moments in college, because it taught me two valuable lessons. First, I learned that grease from steak can explode, and if it does, it will shoot a permanent grease ring around your tiny apartment kitchen. But I also learned that food brings people together, that there's something about sharing a meal with others where the differences fade away, the walls come down, people get to connect with each other and learn and grow together, and it leaves an impact on you. We're kicking off a new three-week series today called Dinners with Jesus, and what we're doing is we're taking three moments and looking at moments where Jesus used meals to make a lasting impact in the lives of others. And this morning, we're going to look at the feeding of the 5,000, and this is one of my favorite miracles that Jesus performs. And one of the coolest things about it to me is that this meal was so significant that it's the only miracle of Jesus that appears in all four Gospels with the exception of his resurrection. So it's kind of a big deal, right? Well, this morning, we're going to be looking at John 6. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can go ahead and turn there, and that's where we'll be for most of the day. But before we dive into Scripture this morning, I want to give you a little bit of background on the book of John. Now, John is one of the four Gospels, which are eyewitness accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus. And three of the Gospels are what we refer to as the Synoptic Gospels. And what that is, is these are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and these three Gospels are incredibly similar. In fact, they share about 64% of the same content among those three Gospels. But then you have the fourth, fourth Gospel, John, and it's incredibly different from the other four. In fact, John's material is 90% unique to the book of John. But there's a reason why it's different. During the time of its writing, there was this belief beginning to spread called Gnosticism. And what Gnosticism was, in a nutshell, is the belief that anything of the world, anything worldly or on earth, was evil or imperfect because they believed it was created by an imperfect subpar God who was different from the perfect supreme God in heaven. And so because of this belief, they began to spread the lie that Jesus could not have been God because if he was born on earth, that that would make him imperfect and evil, therefore he could not be divine. And so John writes his gospel to not only prove Jesus' divinity, but also to disprove Gnosticism. And so you'll often hear scholars refer to John as the spiritual gospel. And the reason for this is that John is trying to show the God side of Jesus. And so there's a lot more miracles and moments of authority than some of the other gospels. And there are also in this book what scholars refer to as the seven signs and the seven I am statements. 
Now, the seven signs are these incredible moments where Jesus displays his power and authority through a great miracle. And the seven I am statements are moments where Jesus claims his divinity as God in different ways. And as we look at our passage today, we're going to look at both one of the seven signs, which is the feeding of the 5,000, and one of those I am statements. So let's start with verses one through four this morning. It says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Now, by John 6, Jesus' ministry is kind of taken off. He is gaining notoriety among the people because they've watched him do amazing things and word about the miracle man from Galilee is spreading. And right before our story, just a chapter before this, Jesus has an open debate with Pharisees and his responses actually leave them speechless. And so people are amazed with Jesus. They're amazed by the way that he speaks with such power and authority. And they're amazed at the miraculous power that he displays. And so it's no shock that as Jesus tries to withdraw from the crowds to the Sea of Galilee, he actually draws another crowd at the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus, he uses this as a moment to not only display his power and authority, but also to teach his disciples. And a key to notice here is verse four. It's a small verse and it says, the Jewish Passover festival was near. Now Jesus, he's a pretty intelligent guy, right? You kind of have to be when you're the creator of the universe. And so he knows that the Passover, which was the events of Exodus where God leads his people and rescues them out of Egypt, this would have been on the forefront of the minds of the people that are present here. And so Jesus, he plans to use this as an opportunity to provide for these people because if he provides for them, it would remind them of what God did in Egypt and it would give him an opportunity to talk with them and make an impact in their life. See, Jesus, he was an opportunist and he didn't wanna waste a moment. Now, we just finished up a series for the past five weeks where we've been talking about what does it really look like to be Jesus' church. And last week, Nathan finished up the series by talking about how the church is the mission, that we've been given this incredible mission by God to make disciples of all nations, that we baptize and we teach people everything that Jesus has commanded. And the way that we want to accomplish this mission at Kara City is that we want to share intentional grace, which is love and truth with individuals, one person at a time, that we want to change our city and our world through the grace of Jesus. So the question I want to pose to you this morning as we walk through this scripture is if this is our mission, how do we make the biggest impact possible? Well, I think that starts by recognizing the opportunity that we have before us. Because whether you realize it or not, we have an incredible opportunity to make the kind of impact right now that can change the world. And I get that some of you may be like, I don't know about that because have you seen our world lately? And I would agree with that. I think most of us, when we look at our world, we feel like it's pretty spiritually closed off right now. You look at the things in the media and the culture and what we see is this dark, evil world who's closed off from faith and closed off from Christianity. But the reality is, is that's not as true as we think it is. In June, there was a study done by the Barner Research Group, and what they did is they took a survey among Americans from the ages of 13 and up, and what they found was that among every single generation of Americans, that at least two-thirds of the population was open to spirituality and faith, every single one of them. But more important than that, the two generations that were the most open to spirituality and faith were young Gen Z, and of all people, Millennials. These are the two generations that the church has been telling ourselves that we are losing, that they're cut off and separated from God, but these are the very people who are seeking truth the most right now. In fact, 74% of Gen Z teenagers said they want to know more about Jesus. And so here's what this tells us, is that people in our world are seeking truth and they are searching for that answer wherever they can find it. And so we not only have an obligation as the church, but we have an incredible opportunity right now to share truth with the very people who are looking for it. We have an opportunity to be the light on a hill that Jesus has called us to be and to provide answers for those who are seeking. And so here's what I wanna challenge us with today, is that as we work through our scripture and as we respond as a church, 
Let's follow Jesus' example. Seize the opportunity that's in front of us and take the truth and message of Jesus to a broken world. So let's look at our next verses. These are verses five through six. It said, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Now, I love this detail because this is the only gospel that actually talks about this part of the story. Every other gospel leaves this out. But I think that it's incredibly important for what happens here. Because Jesus, he sees the crowd, he knows about the Passover festival, and so he makes this plan. He knows he is going to provide. But then he stops and he asks Philip, where can we buy bread? And it says specifically that he does this to test his disciples, to test Philip. Because Jesus, in reality, he doesn't need Philip to be here. He's already got this planned out. But he wants Philip to be involved. So how will Philip respond? So does Jesus need Philip in this moment? No. But does Jesus want Philip and his other disciples to be involved in what Jesus is about to do? Absolutely. And see, that same thing is true for us. See, if I can be real with you for a minute today, just be a little bit honest with you, God does not need us. That God's plans do not hinge on our obedience or our abilities. That he is the almighty creator. He is the alpha and omega. He is all loving. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. And his plans are cemented. He has them written down, prepared, and he wins. And if you don't believe me, flip to the end of your Bible. You'll see it. It's written. Jesus wins. God wins. It was planned from the very beginning. So God does not need you to accomplish his mission. But God wants you to be a part of it. And we need to understand the significance of that. That we get to be a part of leading others to Christ. We get to be a part of changing our city, our community, and our nation through love and truth. That we get to be a part of changing the world through intentional grace. And that matters. See, the reality is, is that if you want to make a lasting impact, you have to get involved. That if you want God to do amazing things in your life, you have to be active with his church and with his people. This is what he's called us to. And that's exactly what he's trying to do here with the disciples, right? He doesn't need them to be a part of the mission. He doesn't need them to be a part of this miracle, but he wants them to be involved. So how do they respond? Well, look at the next verses with me. This is seven and nine. It said, Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. And another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Now, I don't know about you, but in this moment, I would expect the disciples to have a completely different response knowing that they know Jesus, knowing that they've seen what Jesus is capable of already up to this point, I would think that their response would be, Jesus, we know you, we know what you can do, so do a miracle. But that's not what happens. Philip, he looks at this crowd, and his response is, cost is too great. And the other disciples really aren't any better. Andrew goes out and he tries to find food and what he returns with, he brings a small boy to Jesus who has two fish and five loaves, but Andrew already knows. He says, look, it ain't enough. And so if you don't understand exactly what small amount we're talking about here, this would kind of be the equivalent of me walking up to one of you and saying, hey, here's what we need to do. We need to feed the entire student body of Katy High School in five minutes. Go find food. And you come back to me and you go, I have good news and bad news. The good news is I found some food. The bad news is it's a couple of sardines and some saltines. It's not going to get anywhere. But I was talking with Adam the other day, and he brought up a really good point here, that you at least have to commend the disciples for what they're doing here, because they're not discounting the situation, right? They're not writing it off entirely. They try to come up with solutions for the problem, but the issue is not the disciples in action is that the disciples both end up with the same response of unbelief. And Andrew's response in particular is interesting to me. He says, how far will they go among so many? How often is this not our same response to God? Because if we're honest with ourselves, 
we're really good at coming up with reasons as to why we can't make the kind of impact that God wants us to. And maybe you know what this looks like because maybe you've told yourself you're a sinner and God can't use you. Maybe you've told yourself, you know what, you're, just, you're not good at talking to people and so this is not your strong suit. Or you have limited time and limited resources so you're not really sure how you can even help. Or maybe you feel like you don't have the kind of theological training that you think it takes to make disciples. I mean, you're one person. How far can one go among so many? And we can turn around and have that same mentality about our church at Karis City. I mean, how could we change the city of Katy? We're a small church. We've only been around for a little over two years. We don't have unlimited resources. We have limited resources. We're a small church. We don't even have our own building. How far can one small church go among so many? But see, the issue is, is that these responses miss the same point that the disciples did, is that we can't, but God can, that God uses the least likely people to accomplish the greatest of goals and the greatest of tasks in his kingdom. God used a 100-year-old Abraham and a barren Sarah to give birth to nations. God used a stuttering murderer in Moses to lead his people out of Egypt and through the wilderness. Jesus took 12 ordinary people who fled from his crucifixion and use them to change the world through the message of Christ crucified. Jesus took Paul, the chief of Pharisees, a murderer of Christians, and turned him into the most impactful missionary the church has ever seen. What seems impossible to us is an opportunity for God to do amazing things. You know, when Nathan and Lil decided to plant Karis City, I don't know if you realize this, but I mean, the odds were not in their favor at all. And Nathan will tell you that. He, I can't tell you the amount of times that he and I have talked about this, and he'll tell you that he had no idea how to plant a church. He had never done it before. And on top of that, he was older than most pastors that do plant a church. Typically, a church planter is gonna be closer to my age. And so he already had that going against them. And then when they get ready to figure out when they meet and do all these things, they don't have a building to meet in. I mean, they didn't even know what their staff would look like. That last point may be a good thing, though, because if they knew they were going to deal with me for the past two years, they might have run for the hills. But if Nathan and Lil had stopped to weigh the pros and cons of planning this church based on their abilities and what was available to them, this church probably wouldn't exist. But they knew that God had called them to this mission, and they knew that God would provide. And here we are, we're two and a half years later, and just look at all that God has done. Look at all the ways that God has provided. That I look and just see all of you here and think about the fact that this should be an impossibility. This should not be what our church is and what it looks like and what we're capable of doing. But what is impossible to us is the reality with God. And so the same thing's true for you. The kind of impact you'll have in, in your life, in the world, it's not based on you or your status or your abilities. It depends entirely on Jesus. And how great a comfort is it to know that we worship and serve a God who knows no limits. So don't limit a limitless God. There is no task too great for God to accomplish. There is not a person in this room that God will not use for his kingdom. And so if all you have to offer God in service is your two fish and your five loaves, bring it humbly to him and watch him as he uses it and you to do great things. And look at the next verses with me. This is verses 10 through 13. It says, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down and about 5,000 men were there. And Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. When they had all enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces of bread that are left over and let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now, a couple of things here as we talk about this. Know that Jesus actually gets the disciples to distribute the bread and ask people to sit. We learn that in the other gospels. And so here's a big key to making a lasting impact in this world, humility. Jesus does not give the disciples grand roles in this miracle. 
In fact, it's quite the opposite right here. All Jesus asked them to do is to show people to their seats and pass around some bread. And so this doesn't really feel like kingdom changing work, does it? Right? Does this really feel like the world changing impact the disciples can have? I mean, these are the 12 disciples, the people trained and commissioned by Jesus. So does it not make sense for them to not be passing out bread, but to be preaching and healing like Jesus asked them to? But this is not the mentality the disciples have. We learn in the other gospels, they just go straight to work. See, the disciples knew that it was better for them to play a small role in this miracle and watch as God impacted the people around them. And so they were willing to humbly submit and play whatever part it looked like because they knew it mattered. So let me ask you, do you have the same mindset of humility as the disciples? Because if we're being honest here, everybody in this room wants to have a grand purpose for their life. But what if the role God gives you in his kingdom is to show people to their seats or pass bread? Would you do it or would it not be grand enough for you? See, the reality is, is that work in God's kingdom, it's not meant to bring you glory. It's meant to glorify God. And so when we humbly submit to God and play our part that he has given us, when we do what he's called us to do in humility, we get to watch God do amazing things. We get to watch God glorified. And that's exactly what happens with the disciples here. They don't play some grand role. They take a small part in this miracle, but they watch God do one of the most miraculous things they have ever seen happen. And so for us, when we humbly submit to God, in service, and we play the role that he's given us with humility, it's the same thing that happens with us. We watch as God is glorified, and we watch as the world is changed, and we get to play a part of that, and that matters. Now, humility is not just about us learning our part in the church, but it's also about recognizing God's role in the church and how we respond to that. So a key detail that you might have missed in verse 10 is that Jesus asks the crowd to lie down in green grass. Now, our translation says that Jesus asked them to sit, but a better translation of the original Greek would have been that Jesus commanded them to lay down or recline. And this is a direct reflection of Jesus being the Lord and shepherd that is talked about in Psalm 23, 1 through 2. And it says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. And so there is this picture of provision that if Jesus is the shepherd, then he is the one who provides. And so this grand miracle, this incredible work that is happening before them, that's unfolding before the disciples and before this crowd, it does not happen without Jesus. That if Jesus does nothing, the disciples feed maybe seven people if they're lucky but they trust in Jesus and obey him. And Jesus feeds thousands of people. And this isn't just ordinary provision here. Scripture tells us that there are 12 basketfuls left over. And so Jesus' provision here, it's not just sufficient, but it's extraordinary that Jesus takes a small amount and he turns it into the miraculous. And Jesus does the same thing for us today, that when we bring ourselves to God, when we humbly submit to him and recognize that he is Lord and we obey him, that he will continue to do the miraculous in us and through us. And we have watched God do that here at Kara City. Guys, I don't know if you realize the significance of this, but we baptized 20 people this year and there's still three months to go. Our average attendance right now is almost double what it was two years ago when we started in the little chapel. We're watching as people are following Jesus for the first time. We're watching as people go from being casual Sunday attenders to being active, involved members in God's church. We are making a difference in the city of Katy. But here's the catch. That is not happening because Nathan and I are good preachers. That's not happening because Selena leads a great kids ministry. That's not happening because Sean leads our team and us in beautiful worship and disciples our students well. The impact that we've had in this world, it's not because of us. The growth that our church has seen, 
is not because of our abilities. And that's not to discount all that we do or say what we do doesn't matter. We hold ourselves to a standard of excellence and we believe in that because this is God's church and we want to be good stewards of that. But everything that has happened in this church, all that God has accomplished is not because of us. It is because we serve a mighty God who does the impossible. And so the same thing is true in your life. If you can recognize that Jesus is the provider, that God is the one who provides, and trust in his provision instead of relying on your own abilities, you will watch God do the miraculous in your life. So submit to him, serve him, trust him as Lord and provider, and let him work in your life. All right, let's look at our last verses together. These are verses 35 through 40. <clears throat> it says, then Jesus declared, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those who he has given to me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. See, the last way that will impact this world is by sharing the gospel. And I know that seems simple, and if we're being real with ourselves, you're like, well, it's church, that's kind of a gimme, right? You ought to be sharing the gospel. But that is the most profound way that we will impact this world. And I love that Jesus calls himself the bread of life here because on one side, it reminds us that Jesus is God. He is Lord, that nothing, anything we do, it's not possible without God. He is Lord and provider. But he also reminds us about this title, that he is enough. That the church, it doesn't need big buildings. It doesn't need fancy lights. It doesn't need cool, fashionable preachers. It doesn't need catchy sermons. What the church needs is Jesus. The church needs the gospel because it's enough. It changes lives. And so if you were to strip away every piece of technology we have, take away our lights, take our cameras, take our TVs, take our speakers, and you were to take away every comfort, take away the building, the roof over our heads, the air conditioning, all of it, but you leave us with the gospel, we have all we need. The gospel is enough. The gospel is what changes lives. And so if we're gonna be the church that makes the kind of impact that we are capable of, we have to be a church that spreads the gospel. And that doesn't happen just from the stage. That means that you have an obligation and opportunity to take the gospel out into a broken world because it needs Jesus. And as we talk about the gospel, I'm gonna be real. I feel like if I don't share it right now, this is kind of a missed opportunity. So if you don't know the gospel, here it is in a nutshell. John 3, 16, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life that Jesus, he loved you so much that he left eternity and the perfection of heaven and he came down to earth to live as a man. He lived a perfect life. He died a death he did not deserve, but that death was a sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice as payment and forgiveness for your sins. But he didn't stop there. Three days later, Jesus rose from the grave, defeating sin and death forever, providing us with forgiveness of sins, providing payment, and providing us with a relationship and eternity with God. Jesus did all of that because he loves you. That is the gospel. It is Christ crucified. It is Christ resurrected. He is Lord and he is Savior. And so if you don't follow Jesus, if you've never heard this gospel before until today, but you wanna know what that looks like, please come talk to me. I'll be in the back of the room in a few minutes. I would love to talk to you about what it looks like to follow Jesus. And if you're here and you don't know what it looks like to share the gospel, come talk to us. I can't tell you how much we would love to teach you to share the gospel and to provide resources with you for you to be able to do this. But we have to take the gospel to a broken world. I told you at the beginning of this message that we have an incredible opportunity to change this world. And we will do that by sharing the message of Jesus, Christ crucified and resurrected with a broken world because the gospel changes lives. 
You know, in the 60s, there was a man by the name of Chuck Smith. Some of you may have heard of him before. And he made a decision one day that he was gonna take the gospel to the least likely group of people ever, the hippies. And people in his church, man, they got mad. They left the church. They argued with him. They said, look, this is a group of people. They will never accept the gospel. This is a group of people that you will never convince to walk away from a life that is so deeply entrenched in the culture. But Chuck Smith didn't relent. He shared the gospel and he shared the gospel and he shared the gospel over and over. And the miraculous happened. What started as a few hippies attending a church service and staying with Chuck Smith became crowds that were baptized at Pirate's Cove in California. And those crowds became a movement that sweeped across the nation, spreading revival to young generations of America. It was such a big deal that Time Magazine wrote about it, such a big deal that we still talk about it today. It's called the Jesus Movement. The least likely people to accept the gospel were the very people changing the world with it. One of those people was a man by the name of Greg Laurie. He heard the gospel preached to him when he was in high school. He accepted the gospel. He started to follow Jesus and became a part of this Jesus movement. And he went on to found a church called Harvest Chapel. It's still out in California. He's still the pastor there. Uh, It's a church of about 15,000 members now, and they have reached millions of people with the gospel. That's the kind of impact the church has. Chuck Smith, one man, took the gospel to a group of people and countless eternities are changed because of it. So much so that people are still being impacted about the work that started that day 60 years later. This is the kind of impact that we can have as a church here in Katy. That we can be a part of of starting revival in this city, in this nation, and in this world. And I know that sounds like an impossible task for the small young church, but we serve a God who's in the business of doing the impossible. And so God has done so much through us already, but we have just barely scratched the surface of what he's capable of. We can change this world with the gospel. So here's how we play our part in this. Here's how we make the impact. We seize the opportunity before us. We recognize that Jesus is Lord and provider. We submit to him humbly and serve him. And we share the gospel with a broken world. And if we do that, there's no limit to what God will do in this church. Let's pray.